a while back we were talking about uh, the stop button problem, right? You have this, you have this, uh, it's kind of a toy problem in AI safety. You have an artificial general intelligence in a robot. It wants something, you know, it wants to make you a cup of tea or whatever. You put a big red stop button on it and you want to set it up so that it behaves corrigibly, that it will uh, allow you to hit the button. It won't hit the button itself, you know, and it won't try and prevent you. It's sort of uh, behaving in a, in a sensible way, in a safe way. Um, and that like by default, um, most AGI designs will not behave this way. Well, we left it as an open problem, right? And it kind of still is an open problem, but there have been some really interesting things proposed as possible solutions or approaches to take. And I wanted to talk about cooperative inverse reinforcement learning. I thought the easiest way to explain cooperative inverse reinforcement learning is to build it up backwards, right? Learning, we know, like machine learning, and reinforcement learning is an area of machine learning, I guess you could call it. It's, it's kind of a, it's a way of presenting a problem. In most machine learning, um, the kind of thing that people have talked about already a lot on computer file, thinking of Uva's videos and the, the related ones, usually you get in some data and then you're trying to do something with that, like classify you know, unseen things, or you're trying to do like regression to find out what value something would have for certain inputs, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas reinforcement learning, the idea is you have an agent in an environment and you're trying to find um, a policy. But so, so well, let's back up. What do we mean by an agent? It's an entity that interacts with its environment to try and achieve something effectively. It's doing things in an environment. So this isn't necessarily, a, is this a physical thing or is it a... Can be, it doesn't have to be. Okay. So if you have a robot in a room, then you can model that as the robot being an agent and the room being the environment. Similarly, if you have a computer game like um, Pac-Man, then Pac-Man is an agent and the sort of maze he's in is his environment. So let's stick with Pac-Man then. The way that a reinforcement learning uh, framework for dealing with Pac-Man is you say, okay, you've got Pac-Man, he's the agent, he's in the environment, and you have actions that Pac-Man can take in the environment. Now, it's kind of neat in Pac-Man, there are always exactly four actions you can take, or well, I guess five. You can sit there and do nothing, you can move up, left, right, or down. You don't always have all of those options, like sometimes there's a wall and you can't move right, but those are the only, that's the, that's the complete set of actions that you have. Um, and then you have the environment contains sort of dots that you can pick up, uh, which are, they give you points. It's got these ghosts that chase you that you don't want to touch. And I think there's also, there's like pills you can pick up that make the ghosts edible and then you chase them down and stuff. Anyway, so the difference in reinforcement learning is that the agent is in the environment and it learns by interacting with the environment. It's, and so it's kind of close to the way that animals learn and the way that humans learn. Um, you try, you try doing something, you know, I'm going to try, you know, touching this fire. Oh, that hurt. So that's, that's caused me like a negative reward. That's caused me a, a pain signal, which is something I don't want. So I learn to avoid doing things like touching the fire. So in, in a Pac-Man environment, you might, you might sort of say, if you're in a, you're in a situation like, let's draw Pac-Man. Let's say he's in a maze like this. You look at Pac-Man's options. He can't go left, he can't go right, he can go up, and if he goes up, he'll get a dot, which earns you some points. So up gets a score of, you know, plus 10, or however you've decided it, um, or well, whatever the score is in the game, either way. Or if he goes down, he'll be immediately got by this ghost. The point is that Pac-Man doesn't need to be aware of the entire board, right? of the entire maze, you can just feed in a fairly small amount of information about its immediate environment, which is the same thing as if you have a robot in a room, it can't, it doesn't know everything about the whole room, it can only see what it sees through its camera. You know, it has um, sensors that give it some, some information about the environment, um, partial information. I, I suppose just playing devil's advocate, the difference here is you usually Pac-Man is being controlled by a human who can see the whole board. So the point being, if that ghost is actually not static and is chasing Pac-Man and he's heading up to get that pill, if uh, 
if a few pixels later that that corridor, if you like, stops in a dead end, yep. Well, he's kind of stuffed either way, really. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So um, that is because so so most well yeah almost every um, reinforcement learning algorithm, almost everything that tries to deal with this problem, doesn't just look at the immediate surroundings. Or it looks at the immediate surroundings, but it also looks a certain distance in time. So you're not just saying what's going to happen next frame, but so like if you if you go down here, most algorithms would say, okay, the option of going down in this situation is bad, but also all of the options we chose in all of the situations that we were in in the last second or two also get a little bit. There's this kind of a decay. There's time uh, time discounting. So that uh, you're not just punishing the immediate thing that causes the negative reward, but also the decisions you make leading up to it. So that Pac-Man might learn not to get himself stuck in corners, um, as well as just learning not to run straight into ghosts. So that's the basics of reinforcement learning. There's different algorithms that do it. And the idea is you, uh, you actually you start off exploring the environment just at random. You just pick completely random actions. And then as those actions start having consequences for you, and you start getting rewards and punishments, you start to learn um, which actions are better to use in which situations. Does that mean that, in Pac-Man's case, would learn the maze? Or would it just learn the better choices? It depends on what algorithm you're using. Um, a very sophisticated one might learn the whole maze. A simpler one might just learn um, a, a more kind of local policy. Um, but the point is, yeah, you learn you learn a kind of mapping between or a function that takes in the situation you're in and outputs a good action to take. Um, there's also kind of an interesting trade-off there, which I think we may have talked about before, about exploration versus exploitation, in that you want your agent to be generally taking good actions, but you don't want it to always take the action that it thinks is best right now, because its understanding may be incomplete, and then it just kind of gets stuck, right? It never finds out anything. It never finds out anything about other uh, options that it could have gone with, because as soon as it did something that kind of worked, it just goes with that forever. So a lot of these systems build in some. Uh, some, some variance. Some randomness or something. Right, exactly. Like you usually do the thing you think is best, but some small percentage of the time you just try something random anyway. Um, and you can change that over time, like a lot of algorithms, as, as the policy gets more and more, as they learn more and more, they start doing random stuff less and less. Um, that kind of thing. So that's the like, absolute basics of reinforcement learning and how it works. And it's really, really powerful. Um, like especially when you combine it with deep neural networks as the thing that's doing the learning. Um, like DeepMind did this really amazing thing where I think they were playing Pac-Man, they were playing a bunch of different Atari games. And the thing that's cool about it is all they told the system was, here's what's on the screen and here's the score of the game. Make the score be big. <laughs> the score is your reward, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah. And it learned all of the specific dynamics of the game and generally achieved top-level human or superhuman play. The next word is going to be inverse. We did a thing with Uwe on anti-learning, but can't work all the time, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, this is not like that. This is a description of a different type of problem. It's, it's a totally different problem that they call inverse because in reinforcement learning, you have a reward function that determines when you, what situations you get rewards in and you're in your environment with your reward function, and you're trying to um, find the appropriate actions to take that maximize that reward. In inverse reinforcement learning, you're not in the environment at all. You're watching an expert. So you've got the video of the world championship record Pac-Man player, right? And you have all of that, all of that information you can see so you're saying, rather than, rather than having the reward function and trying to figure out the actions, you can see the actions and you're trying to figure out the reward function. So it's inverse because you're kind of solving the reverse of the problem. You're not trying to maximize a reward uh, by choosing actions. 
you're looking at actions and trying to figure out what reward they're maximizing. So that's really useful because it lets you sort of learn by observing experts. So coming back to AI safety, you might think that this would be kind of useful from an AI safety perspective. You know, you have this problem, the core problem of AI safety, or one of the core problems of AI safety is, how do you make sure the AI wants what we want? We can't reliably specify what it is we want. Um, so, and if we create something very intelligent that wants something else, that something else is what's probably going to happen, even if we don't want that to happen. How do we make a system that reliably wants the same thing we want. So you can see how inverse reinforcement learning might be kind of attractive here because you might have a system that watches humans doing things and tries to figure out, you know, if we are experts at being humans, it's trying to figure out what rewards we're maximizing and try and sort of formalize in its, um, in its understanding what it is we want by observing us. That's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, it has some problems. One problem is that we don't... In inverse reinforcement learning, there's this assumption of optimality that the person, that the, the agent you're watching is an expert and they're doing optimal play. And you're, you know, there is some clear coherent thing like the score that they're optimizing and the assumption of the, the algorithms that do this is that the way the world champion plays is the best possible way. And that assumption is obviously never quite true, or generally not quite true, um, but it works well enough, you know. But humans are not, are like, human behavior is not actually really optimizing to get what humans want perfectly, and ways, uh, places where that assumption isn't true could cause problems. So is this where cooperative comes in? Because when we started this, it, we're doing it backwards. It's cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, right? Right. So you could imagine a situation where you have the robot, you have the AGI, it watches people doing their thing, uses inverse reinforcement learning to try and figure out the things humans value. Sorry, try and figure out the things humans value. Um, and then adopt those values as its own, right? The most obvious, like the first problem is we don't actually want to create something that values the same thing as humans. Like, if it observes that I, you know, I want a cup of tea, we want it to want me to have a cup of tea. We don't want it to want a cup of tea. But that's like, that's quite easy to fix. You just say, you know, figure out what the value is and then optimize it for the humans. Say easy to fix, but you know what I mean? It's, that's doable. Um, but then the other thing is, if you're, if you're trying to teach, if you're actually trying to use this to teach a robot to do something, it turns out to not be very efficient. Like, if you, it, it, this works for Pac-Man. If you want to learn how to be good at Pac-Man, you probably want to not just watch the world's best Pac-Man player and try to copy them, right? That's, that's not like an efficient way to learn because there might be a situation where you, you're thinking, what do I do if I find myself stuck in this corner of the maze or whatever? And the pros never get stuck there. So you have no, uh, you have no example of what to do. All, 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 the pro, all watching the pros can teach you is don't get stuck there. And then once you're there, you've got no, you've got no hope. Let's say I wanted to teach my robot to make me a cup of tea. I go into the kitchen and I show it uh, how I make a cup of tea. I would probably have to do that a lot of times to actually get the, all the information across because, and you'll notice this is not how people teach, right? If you were teaching a person how to make a cup of tea, you might do something like, if there's some difficult stage of the process, you might show, you might do one demonstration, but show that one stage like three times. Say, and you see, do it like this. Let me show you that again. And then, if you're using inverse reinforcement learning, the system believes that you are playing optimally, right? So it thinks that doing it three times is somehow necessary, and it's trying to figure out what values, like what reward you must be optimizing that doing it three times is important. Um, so that's a problem, right? That's where the assumption isn't true. 
or you might want to say, okay, what you do is you get the T out of the box here and you put it in the thing, but if there's none in this box, you go over to this cupboard where we keep the backup supplies and you open a new box, right? But you can't show that. You, the, only way that the only way that the robot can learn to go and get the extra supplies only when this one has run out is if you were in a situation where that would be optimal play. So the thing has to be actually run out in order for you to demonstrate that. You can't say, if the situation were different from how it is, then you should go and do this. So the other thing you might want if you're trying to teach things efficiently, you might want the AI to be uh, taking an active role in the learning process, right? You kind of want it to be, like if there's, if there's some aspect of it that it doesn't understand, you don't want it just sitting there observing you optimally do the thing and then trying to copy. If there's something that it didn't see, you kind of want it to be able to say, oh, hang on, I didn't see that, you know, or I'm confused about this, or maybe ask you a clarifying question, or um, just in general, like communicate with you and cooperate with you in the learning process. Um, so, yeah, so, so the, way that, the way that cooperative inverse reinforcement learning works is it's a way of setting up the rewards such that these types of behaviors hopefully will be incentivized and should come out automatically if you're optimizing it, you know, if the AI is doing well. So what you do is you specify the interaction as a cooperative game where the robot's reward function is the human's reward function, but the robot doesn't know that reward function at all. It never knows the reward that it gets, and it never knows the function that generates the reward that it gets. It just knows that it's the same as the humans. So it's trying to optimize, it's trying to maximize the reward it gets, but the only clues it has for what it needs to do to maximize its own reward is observing the human and trying to figure out what the human is trying to maximize. This is a bit like two players on a yeah. computer game, but you can only see one score. Yeah, like if you're, you're, you're both on the same team. Yeah. Uh, but only the human knows the rules of the game, effectively. You both want, you both get the same reward. So you both want the same thing, just kind of by definition. But the pro, so, so in a sense, you've kind of just defined the core problem of as I was saying, but the core problem, one of the core problems of AI safety is um, how do you make sure that the robot wants what the human wants? And in this case, you've just specified it. Usually you couldn't do that because we don't really know what the human wants either. Two people who don't speak the same language can still communicate with actions and gestures and things. Yeah. And you can generally get the gist of the idea across to the other person. Mm -hmm. Is it a bit like that? Yeah, but a sufficiently sophisticated agent uh, if you have an AGI that could be quite powerful, it can speak, you know, and it can understand language and everything else. And it knows that, th so it knows, for example, uh, hopefully it should be able to figure out that when the human is showing something three times, that it's, that the human is doing that in order to communicate information and not because it's the optimal way to do it. Because it knows that the human knows there's kind of uh, there's common knowledge of what's going on in this in the scenario, so it allows for situations where the human is just demonstrating something, or explaining something, or it allows the AI to ask about things that it's unclear about because everybody's on the same team trying to achieve the same thing, in principle. Um, so the point is, if you have a big red stop button in this scenario the AI is not incentivized to disable or ignore that stop button because it constitutes important information about its reward, right? The AI is desperately trying to maximize a reward function that it doesn't know. And so if it observes the human trying to hit the stop button, that provides really strong information that what it's doing right now is not going to maximize the human's reward, which means it's not going to maximize its own reward. So it wants to allow itself to be shut off if the human wants to shut it off because it's for its own good. So this is, this is a clever way of aligning its interests with ours, right? Right. It, it's not, so, so like, 
the, 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 the problem in the, in the default situation is I've told it to get a cup of tea and it's going to do that whatever else I do. And if I try to turn it off, it's not going to let me because that will stop it from getting you a cup of tea. Whereas in this situation, the fact that I want a cup of tea is something it's not completely sure of. And so it doesn't think it knows better than me. So when I go to hit that stop button, it thinks, oh, I thought I was supposed to be going over here and getting a cup of tea and running over this baby or whatever. But the fact that he's rushing to hit the button means I must have gotten something wrong. So I better stop and learn more about this situation because I'm at risk of losing a bunch of reward. Um, so yeah, it, has, it, seems like, it seems like a potentially workable thing, um, a, a workable approach. So uh, one interesting thing about this is there is still an assumption that the human's behavior is in accordance with some utility function or some reward function, some objective function. Like if the human behaves very irrationally, that can uh, cause problems for this system because the whole thing revolves around the fact that the robot is not completely confident of what its reward is. It's got a model of, its, of what the reward function is like that it's constantly updating as it learns. Um, and it doesn't have full confidence and it's using the human as the source of information. So fundamentally, the robot believes that the human knows better than it does how to maximize the human's reward. So in situations where that's not true, like if you run this for long enough and the um, robot managed to build up a really, really high level of confidence in what it thinks the human reward function is, then it might ignore its stop button later on if it thinks that it knows better than the human what the human wants. Um, which sounds very scary, but might actually be what you want to happen. Like if you imagine, you know, it's the, it's the future and we've got these robots and they all have a big red stop button on them and they're all, you know, and everything's wonderful. And you say to your robot, oh, take my, uh, my four-year-old son to school, you know, drive him to school in the car, because it's the 1950s sci-fi future where it's not self-driving cars, it's like robots in cars. Anyway, and it's, um, it's driving this kid to school, it's doing 70 on the motorway, and the kid sees the big red shiny button and smacks it, right? In principle, a human has just pressed the button and a lot of designs for a button would just say, a human has hit your button, you have to stop. Whereas this design might say, I have been around for a long time, I've learned a lot about what humans value, and also I observe that this specific human does not reliably behave in its own best interests. <laughs> so maybe this hitting the button is not communicating to me information about what this human really wants, they're just hitting it because it's a big red button and I should not shut myself off. So it has the potential to be safer than a button that always works. But it's a little bit unsettling that you might end up with systems that sometimes actually do ignore the shutdown command because they think they know better. Because what it's looking at right now is it says, button gets hit, I get zero reward. Button doesn't get hit, if I manage to stop them, then I get the cup of tea, I get like maximum reward. If you give some sort of company...